The Saints are Minnesota bound after hanging on to beat the Panthers for the third time this season. And once again, the team's defense comes through hugely when it mattered most. Plus, LSU loses Matt Canada and its bowl game, but hangs on to defensive coordinator Dave Aranda. What those things mean looking ahead to next season. And the Sugar Bowl was a huge success as this year's college football playoff semifinal. This is the last word on sports. Fourth down on four starts now. It was dramatic and loud and fun. And tonight, New Orleans is celebrating the Saints or two wins from the Super Bowl. I'm Doug Mouton. Welcome to fourth down on four. And we begin tonight with number nine. This season, Drew Brees threw his fewest total passes in eight years. But in game one of the playoffs, Brees carried his team, as Andrew Doak reports. For the first time this season, the Saints went three and out on their opening drive. Then they did it again on their second. Then, even though it was early, arguably the most important sequence of the game happened. Knocking on the door, the Saints forced a Panthers field goal, and Gano missed a 25-yarder wide right. The Saints took over, and two plays later, Drew Brees showed he still has a cannon, and Ted Ginn dropped the mic on his former team. From the play call, you know, it's, uh, it's either me or Mike. You know, just, it's designed for the defense, and uh, I seen uh, Kirk come down, and I know I had a shot. I know I had a chance, so I just tried my hardest to, you know, get to my spot. Drew found me. The rest is history. He a baller. You know, he <laughs> made, when, when, his, when his number called, he makes a play. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Drew, Drew put a beautiful ball out there, and Ted finished it. You know, I mean, he, he, he burned him again. With a guy like Ted right there, he's, he's not really a decoy. If he gets behind you, he's gone. And they let him get behind him, and he did the rest. In the Saints' two previous meetings with Carolina, they ran for the most rushing yards the Panthers' third-ranked rushing defense gave up all season. But today, the Panthers held New Orleans to a season low with only 41 yards on the ground. It was very apparent what the Panthers wanted to do to the Saints offense. Take away running backs Alvin Kamara and Mark Ingram, in turn challenging a Hall of Fame quarterback to beat them with limited weapons, something that Kamara said was not a good idea. And that's the wrong thing to do. It's Drew Brees at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So, you know what I'm saying? When you say, all right, Drew Brees has to beat us, that's not the smartest thing to do. That's Drew. You know, uh, once Drew get into the game, you know, he, he takes off. That would make him great. We've been telling you all year, man, don't sleep on Drew, you know. And uh, if you're going to stack the box and, um, you know, try and stop the run and take us out the game, he's going he's gonna to hurt That's you, good. man. He's, he, we've Brees. been telling you he's the best quarterback in the league, and, uh, you know, he's still Drew Brees, so he proved that today. For the seventh time in a playoff game, Brees threw for at least 300 yards. And with 5.08 left, Brees dialed up another vintage drive to almost put the game out of reach. But back came Carolina, scoring in 59 seconds after Newton hit Christian McCaffrey on a 56-yard pass play to bring the Panthers back within five. And then decision time came for the Saints. On fourth and two, leading 31-26, Peyton gambled for the knockout punch. Uh, he said, you want to go for it or punt? I said, you got to play you like? He said, yeah. I said, let's go for it. But instead, Breeze was picked off and it was put back in the hands of the defense. I said, let's do it again. Let's do it again. With 19 seconds left to play on third and 23, Von Bell kept Funches out of the end zone and then doubled down on fourth and 23 with the biggest sack of his career. We went out there, we finished it, and we hit a home run today. And just making those plays in this atmosphere in this city, man, it's just hey, it's a speechless moment. With this win and the alumni in the building, it felt all too much like 2009. And with a win next weekend at Minnesota, it may not be the last time we see the Saints in the Dome. At the Superdome, Andrew Doak, fourth down on four. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Here is the schedule. The Saints are at Minnesota Sunday. The Falcons play at Philadelphia Saturday. If New Orleans and Atlanta win, the NFC Championship game is here. Cam Jordan and the defense keyed the wild card win, of course, by doing what they've done all season, making the key play down the stretch, as Ricardo LeCompte reports. The old adage comes up all the time during the postseason. Defense wins championships. 
And what the Saints learned in this wild card game against the Panthers is that they will need their defense to capture a second Super Bowl title. Now, granted, New Orleans gave up some numbers against the Panthers, 413 yards of total offense, 26 points, and two receivers cracked the 100-yard receiving mark with Pro Bowl tight end Greg Olson leading Carolina with eight catches for 107 yards. Man, you know, he's a Pro Bowl tight end, man. I think he caught, you know, um, you know, two passes on me. Like, normally all year I've been covering tight ends and I've been doing a pretty good job. I mean, you know, you make some plays and they make some plays. So at the end of the day, you know, you know, we're not going to hang our hats on that. And, uh, you know, we're going to keep it moving. But the Saints' D kept Carolina from scoring touchdowns, making Graham Gano connect on four field goals and allowing just one touchdown in four red zone trips. You know, those are three points. You know, imagine if those three points were seven. Um, you know, it's, it's a totally different situation. And so, you know, for us to hold them to three, you know, was big. And, uh, you know, hopefully we can continue to do that. Hopefully we, we don't even get in those situations. Hopefully, you know, they don't have long drives, but you know, we're in the NFL, they're going to make their plays. This defense contained the Panthers offense for most of the day until Christian McCaffrey got loose for a 56 yard touchdown to cut the Saints lead to five. The defense then had to come up with one major stop with 151 left to go. But just like it's done all season long, that defense was able to get that stop. Vaughn Bell sat quarterback Cam Newton in the final seconds to seal a playoff victory for New Orleans. We're looking forward to it. We was already preparing for it. On the third down, we said we're going to have to win the game. And I said, we did it before. We're going to step up to the challenge. In a big type of environment like this, in a playoff atmosphere, like why not? When you got a team full of guys who, who, would, who would much rather go out there and attempt to make the play, and if they miss it, oh well, you know, you move on. Uh, but at the same time, if you make it, you know, that you, you went and did what you were supposed to do. I think when you get a group of guys like that, uh, along with some established veterans, um, sky's the limit. The defense wants to be the reason this team hoists the Lombardi Trophy at playoffs end. Reporting at the Superdome, Ricardo LeCompte, fourth down on four. All right, thanks, Ricardo, and joined by a good friend, Mike Dettelier from WWL Radio. Okay, look, my first takeaway from this game is how unbelievably good Cam Jordan is on the biggest series of the season. He blows through, makes the play. How good is he? Listen, he's the best defensive end right now playing in the National Football League. When you look at all-around play, there is no question his play against the run, but how well he's been as a pass rusher. Mm -hmm. But now, in the biggest stage, mm -hmm. in the biggest moment for this football team, he stepped up to the plate and he knocked it out of the park. But again, Doug, we go right back to what we've talked about all season long. The story of this season has not been about their offense. Mm -hmm. It's no. been about the defense. Mm -hmm. You Before the season start, you lose Nick Fairley, Delvin Bros down. Mm -hmm. During the season, Okafor, Alex Anzalone, you, uh, A.J. Klein. Cam played huge, especially late. But I think the story of this game has been the top byline all season long. Just how good this defense has played. Yeah, no doubt. And look, the Saints have had a whole season based on this running game and how good it's been. The the Panthers did a nice job today. of taking that away. And you saw how good Drew Brees can be when he needs to be. When they took the run game away, Brees was terrific. Yeah, you look at it in the first half. They rushed the ball seven times for 14 yards. And they were ahead 21 to 9. <laughs> now, if you'd have told me right. seven carries, right. 14 yards, right. man, my thing is that score is Carolina. Right. At this point, Drew was magnificent today in a big stage performance against a team he has drilled the last two times. So finally, Doug, I get out of a week of not hearing you can't beat a team three times. Right. Man, come on. How much pressure was it for Carolina to have to play it? They hadn't sure. beaten you. And now it takes the score. 21 times this has happened when you've played a team three times you're 14 and 7. 14 and 7. That's thirds. pretty good. How much does it hurt to not have Andres Pete next uh, week? That's a big loss because who you play in next week. Yeah. Linville Joseph is one of the best in the game. They get a lot of push right up the middle and the Vikings are one of the teams that when you play against them they can rush four and drop seven in coverage. The Saints can't get consistent pressure just with four guys they got to send extra people the Vikings are one of those special defenses that can do it because of what they have off the edge especially with Griffin 
But the big man in the middle, Linville Joseph, he's alone with no Andrews Pete. That's going to be uh, quite a tale next week. And I hear people all the time badmouthing Case Keenum. This guy was top 10 this season in quarterback rating. They have an offense that goes. The Vikings are a scary, complete team. Agreed? Yeah, when you look at Case, you know, he made Kevin Sumlin a lot of money. <laughs> you know, he was his quarterback at Houston. He got that big deal to go to AM. When I look at Case Keenum, you know he reminds me a lot of Jake DeLone. Mm -hmm. And that, yeah, that pass don't come out real pretty, and sometimes he's a little erratic, but he beats you. He mm -hmm. finds a way to beat you, and the Vikings are a really good football team. They spread you out with their two receivers. Mm -hmm. Tight end Rudolph is really good, and they can run the football. This is going to be quite a test, but you know eventually yeah if you're gonna get back and you're gonna get to the Super Bowl Sunday you're gonna have to pass through Minnesota if it was this coming week or the following right so get it over with now we still have a chance to host a championship but game everybody wants that one game you beat the Vikings oh. and then you have the Falcons here for the NFC championship game you couldn't write a better script to end this season to have it in like that and get to the Super Bowl. Agreed. All right, hang with us. We want to talk LSU football when we come back on fourth down on four. Coming up, we'll shift our focus to the Tigers, who have some big decisions to make when it comes to replacing Matt Canada as offensive coordinator. But they won't have to worry about Dave Aranda, who is staying in Baton Rouge. Plus, Mike tells us why these guys will be key to LSU's offense next season. And later, we'll wrap up Alabama's win in this year's playoff semifinal at the Sugar Bowl. It's been a landmark week for Ed Ogeron and the LSU Tigers, and their Citrus Bowl loss is just a small piece of that. One coordinator is gone, another is staying, and a third position needs to be filled. Use your hands, set that the best news for LSU came after the Citrus Bowl, when Dave Aranda said no to Texas A&M for a second time and opted to stay with the Tigers. And the fact is, for 59 minutes, Aranda's defense was plenty good enough to win the Citrus Bowl. But then Notre Dame hit the home run in the final minute. A tremendous catch by him, obviously. You know, we had Dante on him, uh, best cover guy. You know, he's a bigger receiver, but he made a tremendous grab. How he caught it behind his head with one hand and um, how, just how he did it was just spectacular. You can't fault Dante for that. And Dante Jackson is now one of those Tigers making the NFL decision. Arden Key has gone pro. Darius Geis certainly will. Jackson and center will clap or the wild cards. You got to make a tough decision and uh, talk it over with some of the people I trust the most and see where it takes me. LSU's offense will have a completely new look in 2018. The separation with Matt Canada is now done. Re-elevating Steve Ensminger is now a possibility. And in Orlando, the Tigers' special teams were a disaster. I will hire a special teams coach full-time. Uh, that's something that we plan on doing uh, pretty soon. And Ogeron said former Saints special teams coach Greg McMahon is a strong candidate. And what was LSU's weakness in 17, both lines should be much better in 18. Freshmen like Sadiq Charles and Ed Ingram now have a full season of experience along the offensive line. And the defensive line adds the massive Tyler Shelvin, who missed this season while he got his grades in order. Rashard Lawrence is already a star, and late in the season, we saw the emergence of Rougarou. St. Thomas Aquinas' Ed Alexander is now figuring it out. The last part of the season, Ed's been playing probably the best on the defensive line. Um, what he's doing, going against the center and the guards and everything, he has a chance to be a first-rounder. And Alexander can continue his development under Dave Aranda. Year one under Ed Ogeron finishes 9-4 and four, with lots of reasons for optimism for year two. All right, joined by Mike Dettelier again from WWL Radio. What is your gut at offensive coordinator? Is it Steve Ensminger, you think? Listen, Steve's told me a couple times I don't want it. <laughs> Listen, I'm going to clean it up. When he first asked him to do it last year when Les got fired, his was, man, come on, coach, you crazy. And that was the cleaned up version I gave you, that he didn't really want it. I think Ed would want him to do it. Uh -huh. uh, the intrigue is, does Steve want it? And yeah. if not, then what happens? Listen, Ed's got one chance to get this right. Right. 
because if he messes this one up, uh -huh. he will not have a third try. And I think the key to Ed Ogeron's success at LSU is built on two guys. Miles Brennan, Lowell Narcisse. Mm -hmm. If those guys come through for you, Bill Walsh told me this many, many years ago, one thing that pumps new life into an NFL or a college team, a really talented quarterback. Sure. I think this year you will see a two quarterback system at LSU with Miles Brennan and Lowell Narcisse, but who runs it is going to be the big thing on exactly how all that's kind of pieced together. Yeah, because he may not get a chance to develop a third quarterback he after won't. those guys. Right. He, he won't. And look next year. They start the season out with Miami of Florida, and then the third game of the season, Auburn. Mm -hmm. So listen, that, for a young quarterback who hasn't taken a lot of snaps, that, that's a tough role to start out with. How huge was it to get Dave Aranda back? I know that's a stupid question, but, but how big was that? And what does that say about Aranda's faith in Ogeron? Well, it says the ultimate, because if he wanted to leave, he would have never given LSU an opportunity to match the money right? or whatever was in place. You know, Dave wanted to be here. I've talked to Dave. He likes it in Baton Rouge. Him and Ed just have a good relationship between one another. And I put this out during the week uh, that, you know, being around Ed for all those years, other than Jimmy Johnson and Pete Carroll, I've never heard him talk about anybody at that ilk mm -hmm. like he's talked about Dave Aranda. He mm -hmm. trusts Dave immensely. And also, too, is for a recruit. When you look at what this guy has done and what he's put people in the National Football League at Wisconsin and at LSU, you're going to attract a lot of good people there. So that was a huge hire. Now, Ed needs to hit another one out of the park here at the offensive coordinator position. Yeah, no question about it. All right, guys thinking about turning pro. Which of these guys will be back at LSU? Arden Key's already gone. We know Darius Geis is going. Dante Jackson, Kevin Tolliver, we think they both go. Toby Weathersby on the offensive yeah, line? Yeah, I, I think Toby's gone. Toby's gone. Will Clapp on the offensive line? I think Will stays. Uh, listen, I think he'd be a top 100 pick if he came out. But he would be next year, too. Uh, he will, but... All I know is centers are gold mm -hmm. for NFL people. And so it's going to be a tough decision for Will, but I think he's going to come back. I think Toby leaves already. Coach Joe has said, you know, Dante and Tolliver, they already gone, and we know guys, he'll be a team's pick in round one. He's coming out. Yeah, it's an interesting time for LSU. We'll see what they do with offense quarter. Mike, terrific job Thank as you, always. Doug. We're back with more. Fourth down on four in a minute. Still ahead, this year's Sugar Bowl game was a huge success for the Bowls committee. And over the next few years, they'll play a huge role towards crowning a national champion. That story when we come back. College football plays its national championship Monday night. Of course, Alabama got there with a Sugar Bowl win this past Monday. And New Orleans remains a major part of the postseason picture, as Ricardo LeCompte reports. Another playoff success in NOLA. The Sugar Bowl hosting the college football playoff semifinal for the second time. And this year's Clemson-Alabama matchup projected to make the Sugar Bowl over $200 million. Not only did we have two great teams that have been there, you know, in recent years, but they also, both the proximity was great. This same game in Phoenix, who knows, you know, how that might have, have turned out. Uh, in terms of fan travel, but we were fortunate this year and we'll be thankful for that. And that's the landscape of this playoff format. The Sugar Bowl, like the Rose, Orange, Fiesta, Cotton, and Peach Bowl, rotate the semifinal games each year. The Sugar Bowl comes back in rotation in 2021, but the Mercedes-Benz Superdome will host the CFP National Championship game in the year prior in 2020. That rotation could change if the playoffs expand to six or possibly eight teams. Selfishly, from a bowl perspective, we'd like to keep it right where it is. You know, we're, we're part of it. We get to host it every three years. You don't know what happens if, if they expand and, and start having quarterfinal games and, you know, what that might mean in terms of introducing uh, other cities uh, to the process. The playoff future is still undecided, and so too the method in filling seats during non-semifinal years. The Sugar Bowl last year with Oklahoma and Auburn generated the worst attendance numbers since Old Tulane Stadium expanded following the 1939 game. You have to work a little harder to generate the interest 
in the game, and that's something we're still trying to get our arms around and figure out. We do have the SEC and the Big 12 as partners in those off years, but we're finding that, that we're really having to work and, and, and uh, think outside the box a little bit. Keeping the bowl tradition while integrating a possible expanded playoff field will be a challenge for the Sugar and other of the Big Bowl games, but for now, the Crescent City is one of the mainstays for the college football postseason. Reporting from the Superdome, Ricardo LeCompte, fourth down on four. All right, thanks, Ricardo. Here's a question. Could Nick Saban and Kirby Smart possibly look more uncomfortable? The final photo op in Atlanta today, college football's national championship starts at 7 o'clock tomorrow night. Again, as Ricardo said, New Orleans is not involved in the playoff next year, but will then host the championship game after the 2019 season. We're back with more. Fourth down on four in a minute. The Saints make the first of what they hope will be two trips to Minnesota this weekend. Our coverage from super cold Minneapolis begins Wednesday night and we'll have another black and gold playoff special Friday at 630 here on Channel 4. It's a fun time for all of us here at Eyewitness Sports. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week on 4th Down on 4.